gonna let me down. Sing it out. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Never draw. Oh, yes, you're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. and neighbors and greet them here at this place of grace. Welcome, everyone. Welcome.
Well, good morning. We're going to talk about what's happening here at Harvest Point. I've been reminded by Gretchen that it is not only not too early, we may be getting a little bit of a late start on Operation Christmas Child giving this year. And so there's a box out in the foyer that we want to make sure everybody's aware of. Please do begin collecting those items so that we can have a big successful uh, mission uh, giving to that Operation Christmas Child program this year. I uh, want to remind people that the youth meeting tonight is, I believe, at 5, not at 6. Is that correct? I believe so. And uh, I'm going to be joining the youth tonight. I'm looking forward to that. We've also got our continued series of Get to Know the Pastor Conversations, and we'll be having some more of those. We've got slides up uh, that show in the foyer. We've got them here. We hope that you'll come, and we can have a chance to get to know one another, talk about the future talk about our shared ministry here at Harvest Point UMC. Um, want to make sure that I share with you a bit of special news. Cindy Smith, and I'm going to ask her to stand. Everybody knows Cindy. You don't have to come up on stage. You just wave your hand or something. Cindy uh, participated yesterday in the district's lay servant ministry training. So she is now going to be beginning a new means of service to the community, to the church, to this congregation and we're very very excited and I want to celebrate that with her so if you would please we're very excited about what God's going to be doing with you yes for those who might not have heard that and for anyone watching um, Wayne says that uh, prime timers is beginning again on Tuesday at 10 30 in the lodge so yeah you can clap for that <laughs> And we're also going to be doing our offering at this time. And so while ushers come forward, I want to remind you that uh, you can also give online. And we just certainly appreciate um, your gifts and your support. If you would, please do what you do when you pray. Creator God, we have nothing. Nothing at all that you haven't provided for us. Everything that we have is, is yours in stewardship. It's just passing through our hands. We ask you to help us be free givers, givers of ourself and our resources, our time and our service. We ask that you would grab hold of our hearts and make us not only generous givers, but joyful givers. We pray that you'll be with all those who couldn't be with us here in person tonight, today. And we ask that you would put a special measure of blessing in their life. We remember them and we miss them for not being able to be with us. It's in your name that we pray today. Amen. So oh. 
turn this microphone on. I'm very glad. So glad that you chose to be here this morning, whether you're here in person, whether you're here online. Thank you, Wayne. I know I'll need that before the end of the service. <clears throat> We're going to be continuing. This is the third in our series of messages on journeying down the road of life. And uh, hopefully this little simple parable will be something that can help us to continue to illustrate some important truths about what it means to let God lead. As many of you know, uh, here at Harvest Point, we are very, very fortunate to have a certified professional in American Sign Language among our midst, uh, a nationally certified interpreter, if I believe I've got the language correct. Um, and I'm going to ask for Deanne Harmon to come up. She is the head of our ministry to those who are deaf or hearing impaired. And she's going to stand here, and she's going to be sharing her gift of sign language interpretation for us this morning as I retell the story of the road of life. Deanne will be simultaneously translating into ASL. So, <clears throat> ready? At first, I saw God as my observer, as my judge, keeping track of all the things that I did wrong so as to know whether I merited going to heaven or hell when I died. God was out there, sort of like a president. I recognized God's face when I saw it, but I really didn't know him. Later on, when I met Christ, it seemed to me that life became rather more like a bicycle ride. Only the bike was a two-seated tandem bicycle, and I noticed that Christ started out in the back, helping me to pedal. And for a time, I was content at just having the extra help to make it up the steep inclines and to keep going on those long stretches of roads. I don't know just when it was that Christ suggested to me that we change places but life has never been the same since I said yes. When I had control, I knew the way. It was rather boring at times, like going through the motions, but things were at least predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points. But when Christ took the lead, I learned that Jesus knew delightful long cuts that led up unexplored mountains. They took us through rocky places, sometimes at breakneck speeds. 
And at times, it was all that I could do just to hang on. And even though it looked like madness, I would hear God in Christ's voice calling out to me, pedal. I worried at times, and I was anxious, and sometimes asked, where are you taking me? And Christ would smile gently, sometimes even laugh a little while not answering. And I started to learn to trust. I forgot my boring and predictable life and entered into the adventure. And when I would say I'm scared, Jesus would lean back, touch my hand. Christ took me to places where I met people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing, acceptance, and joy. They gave me gifts to take on my journey, my Lord Jesus's and mine. And then we were off again. And then Jesus surprised me by saying, now give the gifts away. They are in you now. You can give them away to others. Don't just carry them around as if they're baggage. And so I did to the people that I met on the journey. And I found that in giving, I received, and that still my burden remained light. I didn't trust Christ at first to be in control of my life. I thought that he would wreck it. But God knows bike secrets, knows how to make the cycle bend to take sharp corners, knows how to jump to clear high rocks, knows how to make it fly to get us through the scary passages. And I'm learning. I'm learning to shut up and pedal. Pedal in the strangest of places. And I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face with my delightful, constant companion, Christ Jesus. And when I'm sure that I just can't do any more, Christ simply smiles and says, pedal. Thank you, Dan, for sharing your gifts with us this morning. It's an amazing gift to have as a part of this community, isn't it? This Sunday, we find ourselves talking again uh, about the road of life. We're specifically talking about community, and our focus is going to be on God acting through us. And I'd like for us to begin by looking at Acts, uh, the second chapter of Acts, 42 through 47. And I invite you, if you have a Bible with you, to read along. Or if you want to, you can read uh, on the screen. I believe we'll have it up there. Um, so please feel free to read along with me. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I invite you to do what you do when you pray. Creator God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. For you are our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Come and speak in ways that transform and make us new. It's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the second chapter of Acts, it's one of the essential chapters for helping us to understand the earliest days of the early church community. And today I'd like to try and talk about one particular aspect of community, that of sharing with one another. Uh, and I want to try and talk about it in a couple of different ways. Notice immediately 
that the focus in this reading from the second chapter of Acts is not upon the lives of individual disciples. Last week, we looked at a passage where the disciples were called by name, where Simon even was given a new name by Jesus. But here there are no names. Rather, here the focus is on the collective life of the individuals that are gathered together as a community of disciples. And anyone who has lived for any significant length of time can tell you that community is an incredibly powerful thing. It's a force that's capable of accomplishing amazing, amazing things. It's true of nearly any type of human community. It's as simple as basic arithmetic, right? The coming together of several individuals for common purpose can create something that the activity of just one individual working alone could never do. Marsha Brown, some of you may know this book, in a classic children's book, Stone Soup. Has anybody seen know Stone Soup? Yes. Okay. Tells a folk, ter- folk parable about a poor man who, while traveling, found himself hungry and begging for food. He came upon a village of similarly impoverished folks, and he asked for something to eat. But no one felt that they had anything that they could give to feed the man who was begging for food. And so, increasingly desperate, the man hatched a a plan. He obtained an old cooking pot, and he filled it with water, He put in a stone, and then he proceeded to start a cooking fire. Curious, the villagers began to gather around, and and he, in turn, began to explain that he was making the most amazing meal. Stone soup, a magnificent and fantastical dish that, as he said to each one, is almost ready. All it's missing is just one thing. And so to each villager, he would repeat himself, saying to each one in succession, all it lacks is an onion. Oh, all it needs is just a touch of carrot. All it needs is a pinch of salt. And as each villager, curious, volunteered to add a bit of what they had of their own pantry to the pot, the stone soup does indeed then become a delicious and magically created dish capable of feeding and nourishing not only the visitor, but feeding the entirety of the town folk as well. And the moral of the story is simple. When everybody comes together to share their gifts, the outcome is often something that far exceeds our imaginations. We see it all the time in sporting competitions, in the business world, And we see it in the life of the local church. The ability to have a building, to support staff who lead in ministry, to offer outreach ministries, all done through sharing our financial and equally importantly, our volunteer resources. Think about Deanne and her gift of of interpreting. Think about the band's gifts of their remarkable musical talents. Think about Tom's financial and business acumen in running the finance committee. Anyone who sits on a team or on a committee brings a gift to this community, and we all receive the blessings as a consequence. But we know. We know that whenever we get together in the name of Jesus Christ, that there are more than our own number that God in Christ represented in the Holy Spirit is uniquely with us. Time and again, the scriptures tell us that our capabilities are expanded beyond anything that we could accomplish on our own when we come together in Christian community. And the result of the believers giving and receiving of gifts, sharing together in Christian community, we're told is directly related to the growth of their numbers. And there's a lesson there. I don't want to skip over the fact that there exists another essential form of community, one that exists between every individual Christian and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
we as Christians have individually joined the family of the Trinity as Christians. As the tandem bike story says, Jesus Christ has become our constant companion. But in this overly individualistic culture that we live in, we often miss other links between Christianity and community. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, famously said that there is no holiness but social holiness, by which he meant that we are not meant simply for ascetic, overly pietistic, individualized lives of devotion, living in isolation. Rather, we are meant for life together, endeavoring to be holy and to love as God loves, loving each other in the midst of human community. And that's one of the reasons why church and church communities are so important. The messiness of the local church isn't really optional. It is in some ways essential. You may have heard people say, oh, I don't have to go to church. I can be spiritual on the golf course this morning. To which Billy Graham purportedly liked to respond, yes, but you won't. You see, we need each other to live the life of Christians. Very few of us are called to live the lives of the desert fathers and mothers in the days of the early church. There are times and seasons for that, and some have received special callings, no doubt. But most of us are made for life with one another, life in community, life together as the Protestant martyr of the 20th century, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was martyred by the Nazi regime. Life together, as he called it. Inasmuch as we are living in Christ, we are living in community that involves the inbreaking of the kingdom right here, right now. The reign of God right now amongst us on earth. And that is good news this morning. We have here in in the community with the world, community with the church, and community with the triune God. Thinking about community and the spiritual discipline of sharing led me this week to recall the admonition in the passage found in 1 Peter 4, 10, where we read, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Community, as in the stories of the tandem bike, as in the folk parable of stone soup, and the disciples' lives in the second chapter of Acts, they illustrate that it is about the giving and receiving of gifts. In the church, we are called to share of what we have been given in stewardship by God things that God first gave to us. You know, but sometimes, as we talked about last week, some of us sometimes don't feel that we have gifts to give. We sometimes feel like the Magi showing up at Bethlehem, only this time we have nothing special to offer to the Christ child or to his parents. Nothing significant, nothing helpful to offer in the community of those gathered together in Christ's name. I'd go even further. I'd say that almost all of us, at one time or another, have felt that we had nothing to give. Maybe it was because we were depleted. Maybe we'd let our inner wells go dry and go too long without the nourishing replenishment that God can give. Sometimes maybe it's because the enemy of our souls has whispered lies into our ears, either in the silence or perhaps on the tongues of others. Perhaps we once felt we had a gift, but that we lost it or rejected it, and doing so has caused us to question if we ever truly had a gift to give to Christ or Christ's community. Most often, though, I think our doubt comes from our sense of feeling broken. Broken in sin, we certainly are. Broken because of our pride, I certainly am. 
broken because of our failures and regrets. I love the phrase in our traditional communion liturgy that says, those sins and regrets are grievous unto us. Broken because life is played in real time with real people. And there are real consequences for every action that is taken. And frankly, because in real life, things and people get broken. There's a theologian that I have learned to love. His name's Henry Nouwen, who has written powerfully about this very thing. And I'd like to share with you just a bit of what he offers on the subject. He's written so much more than this, but in the modern spiritual classic, The Wounded Healer, Nouwen has written, nobody escapes being wounded. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not, how can we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed, but rather, how can we put our woundedness in the service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. So I asked this morning, and I asked myself, do you have places in your own life that you can name and own as your own individual brokenness? Have you ever considered asking God to meet you in that place of wounded brokenness and make it a source of healing for the community that you live in and serve? a resource that you can use in ministry to others. This past week, while camp meeting was going on, I had two very close friends who each lost one of their parents to lingering sickness and death. They're both part of our, our camp meeting family. And while my grief is pale uh, in comparison to what they're going through, uh, those losses have resurfaced a lot of hard emotions in me. Mom's loss to cancer in 2016 and dad's loss to brain cancer in 2020. My own bouts with cancer in 2018, 19, and 21. The nausea and dysthesia and neuropathy and suffering of chemotherapy. The weakness of COVID pneumonia and my beloved brothers suffering a series of strokes. I can choose, we always can choose, I can choose to let those griefs and scars leave me broken and wounded, or I can ask God to sanctify that suffering and turn it into a gift for the community. I could forever mourn the loss of an envisioned future that will never come to pass. Or I can ask God to meet me in my woundedness and help me be healed and participate in the healing of others. There's a form of pottery that I like to use when I'm talking about how brokenness can be transformed by Christ into something new. How many of you are familiar with the Japanese pottery tradition, and I'm going to mispronounce it, I'm afraid, of kintsugai? Anybody? Okay, a couple people. Great. You may have seen the images on social media or the Internet. These amazing vessels are made up by reassembling the broken shards of a bowl or a cup. Using gold or other precious metal staple seams, binding the pottery together again. In the process, we find that that which was broken, that was no longer of utility, is made in the hands of a master into the new vessel that is not only useful and whole, but strong and beautiful to behold. 
like the broken tiles that make up a mosaic. In the hands of the Creator, our lives, with all of our wounds and scars, can be brought together with pieces carefully configured congruently with one another in just the right way to reveal something beautiful in the Creator's eyes by the Creator's hands. If you are determined to be a blessing, God can and will take your brokenness and your woundedness and turn it into a healing gift for the good of the community. Another illustration to try and make the point. Think about a water bearer, someone who's carrying two pots of water across his shoulders back to a village that he shares with many others. Each pot of water is full when he starts out, but one has a crack in it, a broken place out of which a steady stream of water falls to the ground. Some of the others in his village are critical of the man, saying, frankly, how stupid he was and how inefficient his manner of transporting the water was. That is until one day when the wisest person in the village silenced the critic, saying, you, you criticize this man, but he brings more than water to our village. All along the path that he walks every day, do you not see that on one side there is now growing a line of grass? That's because seeds have fallen, blown in on the wind, fallen along his root, and they've been inadvertently watered by the broken spot falling from the pot. Soon flowers will come followed by shrubs into which fowl and game will make their homes. What you see is foolish and broken, has been used by the Creator to bring abundant new life. Unless we forget the most important woundedness of all. Turn your attention with me to the story of Thomas at the end of the Gospel of John, for Thomas's post-resurrection encounter with Jesus. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, unless I put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting. And believe? Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I don't know how many times I'd heard that story in my life before this week. Thursday night at our missionary offering, the uh, the speaker at the missionary service told that story, and I saw it with new eyes. Did you catch it? Many of us feel like we already know the story, at least many of us feel that way. Did you catch it? This is Jesus meeting with Thomas. Post-resurrection. This is the world after everything in history has suddenly changed. It's the one event in human history that marks everything before and everything after. Jesus has thrown off the shackles of death and the grave and has come to be in the midst of his community of disciples 
once more. And he comes to Thomas and addressing Thomas's needs directly, he says, in essence, see my woundedness, see my brokenness for yourself. And the result of that gift, Thomas's belief. And church history tells us that because of Thomas's belief, Thomas went to the east and eventually founded the churches that scatter across the Far East. There are churches in India to this day that trace themselves back, their lineage back to the disciple Thomas. What God can do with our woundedness. There's a song you may have heard. It was part of the funeral service that I attended yesterday for Peggy McGinnis. Peggy's the mother of Alex McGinnis, the pastor at Life Springs United Methodist Church just south of here in Pike County. She was also the wife to Daryl, the pastor at Pierce Memorial UMC in Sparta. Peggy was a dear friend of the Peabody family. And she'd been suffering for two years in the most awful of declines. And when I heard this song at the funeral, I felt certain that it was a heavenly gift from Peggy to me, to us, this morning, as I was trying to finish our sermon. You see, because the lyrics of the song are, the only scars in heaven, they don't belong to me and you. There'll be no such thing as broken. All the old will be made new. And the thought that makes me smile now, even as the tears fall down, is that the only scars in heaven are the hands that hold you now. The only scars, the only woundedness in heaven are the wounds that Jesus gives as a gift for all of us that we may have life new and life eternal. Christ is the original wounded healer. By his wounds we are made new and ushered into community with God Without Christ's wounds, wounds that endured even the resurrection, we would be lost forever in our own personal brokenness. And yet with Christ's love, we can find our brokenness turned into the gift that blesses others. Giving and receiving of gifts, it's an essential part of community. And sharing is at the very heart of what it means to be in community. In particular, apostolic Christian community. We share our gifts of wholeness, yes, but with God's help, we can find that some of our greatest gifts will flow from our points of brokenness. It's all, it's all part of the upside down, world overturning logic of the gospel of Jesus Christ that doesn't make sense to the world, but which makes the world make sense to Christians. And thank God for it. I invite you to do what you do when you pray. Lord, help us. Help us to come to understand the gifts that you've given to us. Help us to know how they might benefit this community at Harvest Point. And how they might benefit the community outside of our doors hungering and thirsting even for what they know not. Help us to share selflessly like the earliest Christians did and help us to receive the gifts that others have to offer in our community. Help us to look even to our hurts and woundedness to find that which, when surrendered and subject to your transformative love, can be a gift of healing for others. We ask All of these things in the holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's good to be in worship with you this morning. Won't you join with us and with Oscar as he leads us in worship?
go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. 
Go in peace.